Welcome to Abundant Life Christian Fellowship. We're so glad you've joined us for today's message. Let's dive in. Good morning. Man, I'm excited. You guys excited? Come on, now it's pretty bad. You guys excited? That's better. That's better. It's really bad when somebody has to like beg for that. But anyways, hey, so good morning. My name is Kevin Hewitt, and I have to admit, I'm, I'm excited uh, and grateful to be one of the guys that uh, the church, or Jim asked if uh, I'll be able to speak during Shane's um, sabbatical. Um, but I also have to admit that I'm really excited because I'm a lot more comfortable here. So one of the things I get to do in my job is I get to go uh, speak at churches and represent uh, CCHO, and a lot of times we do sermons. And uh, a lot of times, because I'm a guest speaker, I and Lori and I end up having to sit up in the front. And there's a lot of pressure sitting in the front if you've never been in a church, because like they do communion, and you have no idea how they do it. So you're like, like I'm like, I probably shouldn't be this anxious in church. So, but anyways, I'm really excited to be here. We were actually in New Jersey at a church in New Jersey on the uh, East Coast, right on the coast, beautiful place, Lenoka Harbor in New Jersey. And um, again, a little anxious at the beginning. It's about 9.35, and they actually started church at 9.35, which was a weird time, but I understood why afterwards. So, um, and so there was nothing going on. So it's like 9.36, and Lori and I are getting a little nervous, like, this is the week we're supposed to be here right now. I'm just kidding. We did, we, they knew us. We already talked to them. Um, and so uh, all of a sudden, a gentleman steps up with a little handbell and goes, ding, 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 and that started church. Like, everybody stopped talking. Just a little, So I thought, maybe, Sarah, next week we can just start with a handbell. It'd be really cool. So it's cool to be back here, though. Uh, we're familiar. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Kevin Hewitt, and um, I... I'm so grateful to be married to Lori, which we will be celebrating our 34th anniversary next Sunday. So, yes, yes, she has a lot of crowns in heaven. So we have um, two fantastic kids, uh, Haley and Blaine, that you guys both know, and we are beyond blessed with our son-in-law, Brandon, and daughter-in-law, Faith. And of course, I can't say anything without mentioning my two awesome granddaughters, Ari and Emmy. So that's who I am, but I also am blessed to go to work every day with some of the coolest Christ followers ever at Christian Children's Home of Ohio and our family and ministries, where we work hard to help more people experience their worth in Christ. So it's been over 40 years since I accepted uh, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior uh, in my bedroom after hearing uh, my high school basketball coach explain the bridge illustration at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting at Tesla. I will be forever grateful for Coach Curzon's faithful witness for Jesus at Tuslaw. So let's give that up for Coach, man. And I'm also pretty sure after I missed several layups that he is probably, Kevin's never going to be preaching at the church I go to. So, but I also feel um, that God has been refining me over these past four decades. And it seems like, like there's this inverse relationship where the more one desires to become more like Jesus, the more you find out how far you fall short. And you become more and more grateful for his love, grace, and mercy. But I also think that sometimes um, we have bought into the fact that once you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that your life's going to be fine. There's never going to be any pain. There's never going to be any sorrow. And that's not true. One of the things that we are able to do is handle hard things with grace because we understand that God is still in control. And following Jesus means doing hard things. Really, comma, hard things. I didn't want to say really hard things. Well, we didn't put the comma in there. That was my fault, Lori. So it's supposed to be comma, really comma, hard things and shine. And so we're going to be reading from Philippians 2 uh, this morning. And here, Paul is writing to the church of Philippi uh, from prison. And this letter is a little different than a lot of his other uh, letters to churches while um, in the New Testament, where he's a lot of times confronting some type of heresy or confronting some church members or stuff. This, Philipp, Philippians is really interesting because it's written out of an almost tone of mutual affection. And actually, even though Paul is in prison, the note of joy or joyous is actually noted 16 times in Philippians. That's how much Paul really, really cares about them. So this is a really, really interesting um, uh, letter. Um, and the fact that 
I mean, we always are amazed when Paul could fact that he was writing about joy as he's sitting in prison. So let's begin. We're going to begin with the first four verses of chapter 2. And I'm going to be out of the... That's coming up. And uh, I'm going to be out of the uh, ESV. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Hard things, there are a lot of difficult, countercultural commands found in God's word. But these listed here in Philippians 2 could be at the top tier of hard. May we, we may read these words, we may even memorize them, but how do we react when we feel slighted? When we're not getting what we think we deserve? I wonder if somebody like, looks down on us, or we're not chosen for an award or a position that we really wanted. How do we really act? Do we really understand what it means to esteem others better than ourselves? Maybe we should have titled this, Do Impossible Things, Really Impossible Things. But thankfully, Paul comes to our rescue because he writes the prescription of how to fulfill these challenges found in verses 1 through 4, when we read verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being, born, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Anybody excited about that? Oh my golly, guys. <laughs> Was that as depressing as it sounded up here? Is anybody excited about that? Yeah. yeah. Do, thank you, Mike. Yes, do hard things but not for our own glory, but for the glory of the one who loved you enough to die for you, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's not about us. It's because, man, you realize God became a human for us. Matter of fact, he thought you, this, this may be um, heretical to say at times, um, but he thought he counted you and I as more significant than himself, himself and died so that you and I might have a relationship with our Creator for eternity. Now that's pretty cool. That's crazy cool. And Paul gives us the key to be able to do the hard things. Humility. Humility. Even though he was God, Jesus emptied himself. He humbled himself to die on the cross for you and me. One of the things we say at CCHO a lot is we will never lock eyes with anybody who wasn't worth enough for Jesus to die for. We will never, ever, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we will never meet somebody that wasn't worth enough Jesus to die for. Bam. That's a cool thing. So these last, pu- kept, blah, 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 these last past couple of months, I've had the pleasure of seeing hard things being accomplished right in front of my eyes. So Monday, August 5th, this past Monday, was actually a historic day. I don't know who won on the uh, Olympics, so I don't know if that was historic or what. I mean, I love the Olympics. I just don't know who won that day. But it was a historic day, because Safe Harbor, Ohio, accepted their first survivor of human trafficking into placement. So this is uh, homes, cottages, that were built through amazing generosity through God's people in Holmes County. And that, this was actually during construction. Um, so the three cottages are where the girls are going to live. And that, of course, is a chapel. There is a, a school building behind it, and they have an admin building. It is a beautiful place. Safe Harbor was birthed when God got a hold of Melissa Brown's heart and opened her eyes. The young girls caught in human trafficking were significant. And she decided to look not only after her own needs, but the needs of others. How crazy cool is that? Melissa did not start Safe Harbor to bring glory to herself, but to help the church see the need and to show these girls that they are precious in the sight of God and so much more than what has happened to them. 
See, a lot of our kids that we work with, a lot of our adults that we work with even in counseling, become what's happened to them, right? Instead of understanding that they are this precious child of God. But, was it hard? Yes, definitely. Were there times Melissa wanted to give up? Yep. But when that first girl entered the grounds and knew that she was safe, it was all worth it. If it was just for that girl, it was worth it. And her girl's story is unfortunately very reminiscent of a lot of young ladies and unfortunately more common these days, even young men. She ran away from a group home. She got trafficked, found a boyfriend who just happened to know some other men. And fortunately, um, she was found on the streets. They took her to the hospital in Columbus, and she is now the first resident at Safe Harbor. Actually, you guys could pray for her. Uh, she might be loved to death, actually, at this moment right now, because there's only her and there's a lot of staff. Actually, I take it back. They actually got their second placement on Thursday afternoon, but that's still, uh, they're all fired up to help, and the girl's like, whoa, chill out a little bit. Um, but that's all right. I'd rather have that than the other way. Um, and they literally, just like at CCHO, are storming the gates of hell for these kids' lives. And that is really, really cool. And it's really, really hard. And they really, really need your prayers, as we do too. Do hard things. Look out for the needs of the others. Needs of others. How about one of our foster families who opened up their home to a sibling group of three originally? They were seven, five, and four. The, our foster family was a pastor and his wife. They uh, didn't have any kids. Uh, as they were in the place for about a year, a younger sibling was born. That sibling came into the family. And so all of a sudden, they go from no children to four kids. And I'm going to show you a little bit of their adoption hearing. So that's just a short part, and I, hopefully you guys will hear it, but they actually were singing Waymaker in the courtroom. And also included in that crowd of people is actually the juvenile court judge, the attorneys, and the caseworker. So what a difference that family is making for those kids who now, who now have a permanent family. And the fact is, do hard things. Jesus is the way maker. Adoption can be a long, uncertain... I know we have adoptive families in here, and we have some people that have been adopted. It can be a long, uncertain, drawn-out, confusing process. Is it difficult? Yep. But for those kids, they are significant. And when those parents said, I want them, that's a picture of God saying that to us, that I want them. Because isn't it cool... Or is anyone here grateful that we are adopted as daughters and sons in the family of God? Amen. Do hard things. By now, many of you are aware that Lori and I led a group of 17 people down to Papaleon, Peru, to our affiliated... Lori, don't cry, because it makes me cry here, so stop. <laughs> to our affiliated ministry at CCHO Esperanza de Ana. It's a mission that our, our church, ALCF, also supports. So our group this year included uh, AOCF members, CCHO staff, and several children of, of CCHO staff, and a CCHO board member and his granddaughter, uh, who the CCHO board member, I'll talk about Dave a little bit later, but he really, really blesses his grandkids, and uh, he's kind of set the bar pretty high for us grandpas, but when his uh, grandkids graduate, he takes them wherever they want, wherever in the world, and it... Uh, it's pretty blessing. So this, this, Emma and Dave actually went to Machu Picchu after 
uh, being at Choka with us. So what a cool grandpa. So I asked if he would be my grandpa. He did not answer yet. So, um, so our group uh, actually didn't, a lot of them didn't know each other prior to our prep meetings in the spring. Our group included five men and 12 women with ages ranging from, get this, 16 to 77. 61-year gap. Going on a mission trip anywhere, let alone a one 3,600 miles away, is scary. Some people may even say terrifying. Not only are you going to unfamiliar territory, in this case, you're going to be the minority, and English is not the language spoken there. I'm tremendously ethnocentric. I don't even like it on a plane when somebody starts speaking Spanish first. I am so ethnocentric. I'm like, shouldn't that be, shouldn't that be uh, English first and then? So I'm okay with Spanish. But you actually go, and it's a different feeling when you're not speaking the primary language. The food's a little different. Really, everything's different. But, oh, there is so much in common as well. And we need to focus more on the commonalities than the differences. And that doesn't even begin to describe the FOMO you have, particularly when you go down over a holiday. This year we missed family celebrations, a wedding, and for anybody that's a golfer, I actually had to miss an invitation to Sharon Golf Club. Not that I'm not over that or anything, but I had to miss an invitation to Sharon Golf Club and more. So why go? Why go? Because Jesus tells us to. So Jesus said, we know this as the Great Commission, so Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, we use that as a great commission a lot, but I think a lot of times we forget about all nations. And then you start reading stories of the people that have taken the gospel to other countries. And you know what? You guys know me that know me well. I love sports. I know totally useless sports information. Like, if you want to know who the 1941 Cy Young Award winner was in the American League, I could tell you that. Nobody has ever asked me that question in my life, but I could tell you that. So I know I love sports. But athletes are not heroes. They are very good at playing a game. They're not heroes. Heroes are those people we just described and people that have taken the Gospels to the all nations. That's who heroes are. And also by going to Esperanza de Ana, we get to spend time with Jim and Tony K. Schutz, the directors of the ministry. Jim and TK were called to serve God in Peru nearly 15 years ago, even though they both had successful careers and family back in the States. Was it hard? Definitely. Is it still hard 15 years later? Definitely. Actually, two weeks after we um, came back, actually it might have been closer to a month after we came back, uh, TK's um, dad passed away, and she had to pretty much move a lot of things to be able to get back for, to see him on his deathbed. And I can't imagine how difficult that had to be because of the fact you think you're serving God and yet life still hurts, right? How hard that had to be. It's still hard. Are they living out the instructions of Philippians 2, esteeming others better than themselves, looking out for others' needs instead of just their own? Do they have the mind of Christ? Most definitely. Here's a picture of the crew that went to EA with Jim and TK on the far left. So they're way over there in the left. They are my heroes. So this is our first day in Peru, and we're just getting acclimated to the area. So we have walked from Esperanza de Ana, their site, uh, through the communities up a, a little hill that used to be, we used to be at like halfway to the top of the hill, which is the foothills of the Andes. Um, but they have actually, now we stop here because they have actually built homes all the way up the side of the hill, which is crazy wild and crazy cool. But I remember before, uh, so we're going to take the next picture, Sophie. So here we are praying for the communities, for the weak, for the people. And I remember right before walking up here, TK asked us to not take pictures of the houses or the peace pool. Because that was their neighbors. And then she respected their privacy and wanted us to as well. 
It wasn't that we're there on a tour. It was there because we loved Jesus and wanted them to. A powerful picture of looking out for the needs of the others. I mentioned our age range, right? 16 to 77, a span over 60 years. And so I'm actually going to show you a picture of the two people at the opposite ends of that span. So this is Dave and Armani. And I'll let you guess who is who. But what a wonderful picture of two amazing Jesus followers. The cool thing about them, Dave, of course, is 77. I want to be him when I grow up. And Armani is the 16-year-old. Um, Dave spent seven years of his life in a children's home in Pennsylvania. Armani, at nine, was raising her four younger siblings in her home because her mom and dad would go on um, substance abuse binges and leave the family for days. They have had hard things happen to them. They love Jesus. I mean, that picture is such a perfect, perfect picture of them because they love life. Even though hard things have happened to them, they love life and they want people to know Jesus. Armani was especially touched during the mission trip because one part of our day was we'd get meet the staff. And we'd be sitting around. We first had community worship with the team, and that was fantastic. And then we get to meet some of the... They have 18 um, national staff now. And some of their staff's stories were very similar to Armani's and the fact that they grew up in a children's home, had been abused at home, and uh, had come to work now for Esperanza Diana because of their love for Christ. And so we were sitting around on Thursday night sharing what God, what God had done in their lives for the week. And Armani, this 16-year-old little girl, like unbelievably articulate, said, I came to realize that my story means something. And it's not just me that's going through this, that the people around the world have gone through stuff like me. And they survived. And they made it. How cool is that? I mean, that young girl is fantastic. And for those of us that have kids and we worried about if mission trips hurt their sporting careers, I can tell you when she got back, she led her team to the AU championship at the Run for Roses Girls Basketball Championship at Louisville, Kentucky. So that's pretty cool if you worry about a mission trip taking up your sports in the summertime. Um, she's an unbelievable kid, unbelievable athlete. Do hard things. We had some church members do hard things on a mission trip. So this was one of the really hard things for Nancy. She's trying to beat a little girl in a game. But, that, you know... Uh, she's actually playing rock, paper, and scissors with one of our EA kids, and they both, they're sm- you can't see it really good, but they're both, their smiles and their faces are just amazing. But here's the cool thing about Nancy, and you guys all know Nancy, I mean, she loves Jesus, and it's evident in everything she does, um, and esteeming others better than herself. But with Nancy, it started before we even got out of the airport in Cleveland. So we have 15 people, and uh, my anxiety as a leader has nothing to do when we get to Esperanza Diana. My anxiety is getting people there and getting them back uh, uh, alive, really, is the best thing. Um, and so uh, we're waiting in the airport, and we've been waiting a while, so people are kind of like milling around. I really wasn't paying attention to everybody, and they start calling the zones, and they call our zones, and everybody goes, where's Nancy? Everybody's looking around, where's Nancy? Well, I look over, and there's a mom. She had a stroller, big stroller, a uh, carry-on, a diaper bag, and a backpack, and she's trying to navigate everything and trying to get to the jetway to go down with her child. And we look beside her is Nancy, and she's holding a baby. She doesn't even know these people, and she's already holding the baby of this kid as we're in it. I mean, that's Nancy Jerkovich. How cool of a picture is that? And I, did you win, Nancy? The, did you? That's what I thought. See, I said, that's what I thought. Do hard things. Bob and Judy Mutchler, both in their 70s, were a little concerned about the physical requirement. I, I said that with a lot of em- emphasis. 60s. I, I'm sorry. My story means a lot more when you're in the 70s, Bob. So they both are in their 60s. Uh, we're a little concerned about the physical requirements of traveling to another country and the work that we do to help the EA community, but they were such assets to the team. Here's a picture, perfect, or picture, perfect picture 
of Judy is saying, she is saying goodbye to the EA kids. Look at that smile on Judy and that kid's face. How cool. Ah, that's so cool. Always a moving time. Of course, I have a lot of favorite pictures of the trip. Uh, so there's another favorite pic, even though I think I have around 100. Uh, here's the next one. Oh, no, sorry, that's a, that's a wrong one. That's not the one I wanted. But that is Bob uh, make, mixing cement, which is a good picture of our work projects. So, oh, no, it's not this one either. That's Bob playing dodgeball. He drilled, he drilled a kid playing dodgeball. But you're only 60s, Bob, so it's good. If you're 70s, I think I'd feel bad. No, this is really, this is one that just this, like, makes my heart melt right here. So this is Bob. Uh, Bob, I have to, was this Ronnie or Hugo? Do you remember? Okay, I'm going to say Ronnie, because I think it is Ronnie, because I remember the, the coat, the sweatshirt. Um, it's a picture of connection. So Ronnie is the head of maintenance, and Bob spent the whole time, the whole week, uh, working alongside him and making a connection and it was forged despite language barriers, age differences, and yet there was a connection forged by the Holy Spirit that can't be broken. And they did amazing things. And that is so cool. Do hard things. There was one more person from ALCF on the mission trip, and that happens to be my awesome wife. And this is a perfect picture of Lori, because it shows her connecting with the kids at EA, and that smile on her face is usually there 24 hours a day. They love her enthusiasm for Jesus and for learning new things about his creation. Um, she's actually known as the explosive lady because she had explosions, and that was, that was pre-COVID, so you have that history for like six, seven years of her exploding things uh, down there, so that's pretty impressive. Um, but as I said earlier, these kids, they know how much Lori cares for them. And I'm so blessed to be married to her and watch her grow in Christ. When we were first married 34 years ago, and I apologize, Lori, for sharing this, but when we were first married, we made it all the way to Cambridge before she got car sick and wanted to go. She was like, I don't know what I'm not. So we took a couple of Dramamine, and she woke up like Wednesday. But anyways... <laughs> um, but now... She is my partner in leading trips to Peru, and she loves it maybe even more than me. Mm. But she loves it. And she, her smile literally lights up a room, and she has just an amazing way of connecting. So here's my real favorite picture. Mm. Um, we are blessed to be invited into the rhythm of Esperanza de Ana as they attempt to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the people of Choca, Peru. The older kids they actually work with were not home yet from school, so you could add another 15 to 20 teenagers to the, this picture to get a fuller picture of the impact this ministry is making in South America. And actually, they actually, part of their biggest ministry impact is with the parents of these kids, too, which is another just, oh, just such a cool place. After Paul writes the first 11 verses of chapter 2, challenging us to have the mind of Christ, filled with humility, esteeming others better than ourselves, looking out for the needs of others, he goes on to write the following verse. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure." All right, so I have to make an edit here, editorial. Work out your own salvation does not mean that we work for salvation as we know that salvation is by grace alone. But we are saved to be Christ's ambassadors to a lost and hurting world. Not because we need to do works for salvation, but because of God's love. We have to show others that same love. Because he first loved us, we are worthy, we are significant because of Jesus Christ. Oh, how great is the love of God. And then Paul goes on to write, do all things without grumbling or disputing. I actually like crossed that verse out of my Bible because that's way too big. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation 
among whom you shine as lights in the world. Does anyone think we live in a crooked and twisted generation? Does anyone want to shine as lights? Two hard things. Really, two hard things. Esteem others more than yourself. Look out for the interests of others, not just yourself. So our trips down to Esperanza and Ayana have changed a little bit. Because when I first started going down there, we worked with about 10 kids, so I knew all the kids' names. I could tell you their families' names. I could tell you everything. Uh, now, as you can see, they work with well over 100 kids, so I don't get to know them as by much. I still love them to death. But what we get to do is now we get to work a lot with their staff, with their national staff. And one of the cool things for me is to see their spiritual growth in a year. I mean, there is, Eddie is a great, he's like the operations director, and his wife is Doris. And when we saw her last year, she was scared, timid. Really, it was hard to even know where she was at spiritually. This year, she's a fireball on fire for Christ. I mean, you go back in one year, you see this amazing spiritual growth. You know what Lori said to me? We were getting ready to go to bed one night. She goes, you know what? I wonder if somebody visited ALCF once a year. They would say, man, you should see this amazing spiritual growth of the people of ALCF. Damn, that was like a mic drop. I rolled over and went to sleep. But anyways... um, (laughs) Do hard. They esteem others more significant than yourself. Look out for the interests of others, not just yourself. Have the mind of Christ who humbled himself to the point of cross because he loved you and I. Do hard things. Really, do hard things. Oh, and remember when I said I had a fear of missing out on July 4th celebrations because we were in Peru? Well, our friends at EA knew that we'd be missing out too, so they blessed us. And after a moving, powerful time of sharing what God had been doing in our lives, Eddie and David surprised us with our own fireworks show. Now, you guys might have had better, longer fireworks, but I doubt that anyone was closer to the fireworks than we were, because they literally went off right over our head, and we were like getting the ashes out of our hair, but it was so cool because they cared about us. You know, the question and the application for this is real easy. What's God asking you to do that may be hard? Forgive someone? Forgive yourself? Esteem someone better than yourself? Go on a mission trip? Look out for the interests of others? Have the mind of Christ and humility? There are so many things that are hard. When you, but here's the one cool thing about doing hard things, is you get your mind off yourself when you're serving others. Because if you're sitting around thinking about yourself all day, you're in a losing battle. If you're sitting around thinking about how can I serve Jesus by helping others, you're in a winning battle. Do hard things. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today, and I thank you, Father, for these amazing examples of people that are doing hard things for you. And may you bless them, may you bless their hands, bless their work, because I know that they're not doing it for their glory, Father, they're doing it for yours. And Father, may we be your ambassadors to a lost and hurting world. Lord, we thank you for... Thank you for listening to today's teaching. Make sure to click subscribe for the latest sermons. You can find more information about Abundant Life Christian Fellowship and our upcoming events by going to alcfohio.org. Again, that's alcfohio.org. You can also stay connected with us on Facebook and YouTube. We hope you have a great day.